Well, good morning. Everybody's a little bit more awake than last week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask uh, your blessing on this, your word today. Let it go down deep into our hearts. Protect your word. Multiply your word. And grow it in, into, into our hearts so that we might become who you would like us to be and live with you in mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the very first picture of God in the Bible is of God creating the world out of chaos. It says, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness over the surface of the deep. So we're supposed to picture the water just kind of like moving around randomly. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the water, and God said, Boom, and he created day and night, dry ground, vegetation, plants, trees, stars and seasons, birds and fish, mammals and reptiles, and then human beings. And it says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. So you got the picture, out of chaos, God creates something beautiful and good and purposeful. Fast forward to the, to the Corinth, uh, worship there got out of control, and Christians were actually mimicking how the pagans worshipped. They were just wild. Paul wrote, God is not a God of disorder, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. So there are two themes today as we look at the book of Colossians. The first is where God is, there is order, beauty, and purpose. So, for example, in today's content, the, the content here in Colossians reminds me of a simple promise in the book of Deuteronomy, where it says, I set before you today life and prosperity, or death and destruction. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life, so that you and your children may live, and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. He will give you many years in the land. God has told us how to flourish as human beings. If we do certain things, we will prosper and have a good life. The second theme that is uh, writing in today's passage is that God has built certain principles for human flourishing into his creation. Now we're going through the book of Colossians. We're almost through, uh, one more week after this. And uh, we're calling it Marketplace Christianity because Paul is explaining to these Christians in Colossae how to live their lives before, before non-Christians, how to engage their non-Christian neighbors in light of this pagan philosophy there. Last Sunday, Paul encouraged us to put on Jesus, to put on these virtues like putting on clothes. The week before, he told us to take off these old way of living. And uh, last week's verse, uh, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him through the Father. This week, it, Paul takes it the next step. Okay, take off the old way of living, put on, on these new virtues, and then he gets real practical. Okay, this is how you are to live. Now, I must give a little background here, a little, I'll say even disclaimer. Several times in the New Testament, I think it's four times in the New Testament, we find what is called household management codes. That's a big term. Basically, it's a, it, it, it comes from the New Testament era, from uh, Stoic philosophy, how to live your lives. And it was very common at that point, and these, these household rules promoted how to have a good life. And here's Paul's list today, and it is a thoroughly Christian list of how to live a good life. Because the non-believers are watching us. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front, everybody today is going to feel a little bit uncomfortable. So just get ready. Nobody's going to walk away without some little ouches uh, today. Now, it's believed that Paul wrote Ephesians, Colossians, and, and Philemon all at the same time, and they might have even been delivered by the same courier. And in Ephesians, his household management codes are, are, are targeted towards the marriage relationship, whereas here in the book of Colossians, it's, it's, it's highlighting or it's 
It's punching us men in the nose, to be honest, the father's role. Now, why is Paul concerned with household management rules of all things? Well, again, the world is watching us. But for the first time, there is a second generation of Christians coming up. The earliest Christians were all adult converts. Also, they were expecting Jesus to return at any moment. I don't know if you know this, but for 200 years, there was a group of Christians that went out every night to the mountaintop and sang a, a hymn of praise. 200 years. That's how expectant they were of the Lord Jesus to come. So they didn't make certain preparations. And all of a sudden, Paul is realizing, wait a minute, we got another generation coming here. And so he's encouraging this next generation to not conform to the world. In other words, they're kind of settling in for the long haul here. Now, by Paul's time, 15 to 25 years after Jesus rose, uh, was ascended into heaven, uh, there's also a concern for children. For example, he baptized Lydia and Crispus's whole household. That means everybody that lived in the house. The second re reason he made these lists was he envisioned Christianity to be like yeast in society. It was important for Christianity's survival that Christians were not viewed as rebellious or trying to overthrow the Roman government. Now, our citizenship is in heaven, but we live in this world. So he encouraged a slow transformation for survival. In other words, a good citizenship would facilitate evangelism and be a good apologetic for Christianity. It would help Christians be attractional. I've told you this illustration before, how when we were missionaries in Japan, all the missionaries would get together and go collect garbage together. You, oh, you guys really aren't awake yet, huh? <laughs> So the Japanese, after two or three years, would throw their TVs out, and their TVs were still good, and so the, the missionaries were like, whoa, look at that one. You know, and so I pointed out, look, you're, you're basically saying to the Japanese, hey, become a Christian and be poor like us and go through other people's garbage. <laughs> and, and so you see the concept here? We want the, the message of the good news to be attractional. The third reason he writes these rules is that the church was how, met in houses. And how do you do church? They had no idea. So they modeled their early wit, uh, worship after how households functioned. So it made complete sense. Now one last point before we actually look at the text today is I don't want, like I said, we're all going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but let's not read back our American ideas of individual rights and authority and identity. Today's passage is 2,000 years old, and a few things have changed since then. Nevertheless, God has given us principles for God's plan for human flourishing. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Marriage relationships, uh, verses 18 and 19. Wives, Submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Oh, yes, he just said it. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So Paul is not saying women are inferior or of less rank. No, this is about the marriage relationship only. Now, this is, a, again, the issue of our day is individual rights, and we think in terms of status. In Paul's day, the issue was, what is my role? How do I fit into the family? Let me give you some perspective on, on how Paul is thinking here. Lydia, for example, ran her own house and business. So is that inferior to a man? No, she has a business, she's running a large household. Chloe ran her household. Phoebe was a deacon. Nympha had a church in her house, which meant she was probably, if not the pastor, she was probably a very influential voice in that church. Also, Christians are to mutually submit to one another. And Paul insists on equal rights elsewhere. If you were to read 1 Corinthians 7 there, you'd see that, that he's very, I'll use the term, egalitarian in the male-female role. So if he's not saying, you know, it's like head, tail, that type of thing. It's like, what is my role in the family? In fact, Paul emphasizes that it is as, as is fitting in the Lord. We're not to follow the patterns of the Lord, we're to do of the world, we're to do better than them. This is a baseline for our relationships, mutual love and submission, and it provides a boundary for abusive and harsh husbands. 
Recently, Christian counselors have discovered something amazing, that there's only two good factors that are needed in the Christian marriage for it to thrive, love and respect. Amazing how it fits right with what Paul is saying here. These two items are essential for a good marriage, not because of rights or dominance, but because of how God wired us. Generally, men need significance, uh, need respect for their search for significance, and women need love because of their search for security. That's how God made us. Again, this fits exactly with how God made things, hardwired things into his creation for human flourishing. Now, hang on, totalitarian regimes such as Iran, China, USSR, and ancient Rome, they were always scared of the people overthrowing the power. Therefore, it was necessary for the church to be like yeast and slowly bring change. These principles of, of, um, of embedded in Christianity and in the message of the gospel, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, Though the message of, of that, that wonderful image of God in us has and is transforming the world. Uh, the image of God in us is bringing change of uh, bringing equality of race and gender in our time. Hallelujah. Well, let's move on. Family relationships, verses 20 and 21. Children obey, oh, yep, I said it. Children obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Now, it's interesting that Paul assumes the kids are in the, in the, in the worship service to hear his plea for obedience. Children were actually worse off in, in the ancient world than women. Again, this is pioneering to think that the kids were there, um, right there, hearing this message, this letter. Okay, you guys have been listening great. Have you ever tried to get your child to clean up their bedroom? <laughs> I think we've all been there, unless you've got a very unusual child. Um, and you know there's very little uh, uh, effectiveness in raising your voice, right? I mean, there's two things necessary to get that child to clean their room. The child has to want to obey. And you have to, as an adult, have to maintain the respect of the child so that they will hear your advice. I know this is maddening, but please don't lose your cool. Here are the pressures on the fathers to maintain the respect of their children. In the book of Ephesians, a very similar list, Paul, enti Paul entices the children with the Old Testament promise. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Okay, that's good. For this is right. Okay, Honor your father and mother, which is the first command with a promise. Here's the enticement. So that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on this earth. God has given certain principles that if you do them, you will have a blessed and prosperous and flourishing life. It's that simple. Um, I, I remember when I, uh, I moved out east, I sought my father's advice. Uh, just, hey, we're thinking about moving a thousand miles away from the family, you know. And interesting, he gave his blessing and he gave almost prophetic uh, words to me. And uh, I obeyed my, my father. I, 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 I'm an adult. I was an adult. I lived in overseas. But it was like, you know, we, we have a choice in this matter. We think we're hearing God moving us out east. What do you think? And like I said, he gave like a prophetic word. To go against these principles results in chaos. Okay, let's pause our look at, at the book of Colossians uh, and do our little short bit on, on apologetics. If you want to pull out your papers, did everybody get your papers? Papers out. It's very simple today. We're going to look at the Bible. I love the passage in Colossians that we will get to finally next week. We are to live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you'll have the right response to everyone. And like I said, today's portion, we're looking at the right response to everyone. The making them is, is living wisely among those other people. So they are to look at our lives and go, you know, they, they, they've got a pretty good life there. They're not out scrounging for garbage, I mean TVs, you know. 
Well, today let's talk about the Bible. And at some point, if you're going to lead your neighbor, your friend to the Lord, at some point you have to open up the Bible, you have to share a scripture with them. And how many have ever heard something like, you can't take the Bible seriously? Or, you really believe that? So there has to be a certain measure of trust in the Bible for them to believe the words you're going to say from it. Now, when they say you can't take the Bible seriously, it assumes several, several things. That it was written to advance the power, first underline, the power of the church. In other words, oh, just a bunch of people back then wrote fiction for this group of people. They took the oral traditions and they twisted the oral stories about Jesus and twisted them all around so that it would fit their narrative and they could gain power. And they ignored all the Gnostic texts and wrote only what fit the narrative. That's the idea behind the Da Vinci Code, if you remember that movie. Another assumption is that it's regressive. Regressive. That means it's irrelevant because it's so old. This group does not believe in objective truth. Truth is fluid for them. They'll say things like, well, I'm glad it works for you. I'm glad you believe it, but I don't believe it. In other words, it's individual truths, not one objective truth out there. Or number three, the Bible is full of errors. This group holds the, the, you know, the Bible under a 21st century microscope when it wasn't written for that purpose. It was a collection of letters from the first century. Okay, so how do we talk about the Bible to our friends? Well, the good news actually did start as an oral tradition. The first underline there, A. It start, the, the stories of Jesus. People had these wonderful encounters with Jesus. They were healed, they were saved, and they told orally their friends. So it started as an oral tradition. However, um, contrary to what these people think, the New Testament documents are very, very early. They were written, the Gospels were written 40 to 60 years after Jesus' ascension. Paul's letters are 15 to 25 years after Jesus' ascension. And there were hundreds of eyewitnesses. Next to underline, eyewitnesses, hundreds of them. And in contrast to that, these people that believe that, that uh, the Bible is fiction and that these Gnostic texts are, are should be included? No. Like the Gospel of Thomas, that was written 175 years, um, uh, excuse me, roughly 100 years after these, uh, the New Testament documents. So the earlier traditions of, that have been collected and passed down to us are the most accurate. The Gospel of Thomas and these other Gnostic writings, they're just, there's a reason why the church didn't embrace them. Uh, letter C, the New Testament themes actually counter this, this Gnostic fiction. For example, Jesus does not take sides in any church debates because, well, the church hadn't been formed yet. Number two, why would Jesus ever want to be crucified if he was going to start this powerful church? He appears weak and that God has abandoned him. The disciples look petty. They look slow-witted, jealous, and even deny Jesus. The early church stood in opposition to the Roman government. Oh, they were subversive, but they stood in opposition to it. Whereas you read the Gnostic text, I know this is kind of detailed for some of y'all, but to hang on there, uh, the Gnostic text actually uh, buttered up to the Roman government. They, they wanted curried favor with the Roman government. And the last point here is that the literary form is too detailed to be made up. Now, this is a highly technical thing. In terms of literary analysis, C.S. Lewis, he's a, he was a, a historian a, of literature, and he says what we read in the Bible is uh, if it, it doesn't fit with fiction. F these are eyewitness accounts. What we view as fiction, and it, that style of writing never came along, it, it's only been around 300 years. So he is very confident that this is, uh, these are eyewitness accounts. Okay, when discussing the cultural distance, understand that the Bible has its own cultural setting. It's 2,000 years old. Just get a good Bible commentary, 
Issues like um, slavery, women, dealing with the poor are best understood in its context. God has given us wonderful principles to live by. And another thing to point out is that our moment in time is not the ultimate historical moment. So we view it like, wow, we have arrived. We are, we are the best judge of what is truth and not truth. When in fact our grandchildren will say, really? You wore bell bottoms? You actually owned a polyester leisure suit? You got my point. God is not like us. If there is a God, a creator God, it just reasons that his perspective is going to be a little different than ours, right? And now this is for us alone. This isn't for necessarily an evangelistic point, but when you're talking to your friends, uh, please keep in perspective the Bible is God's word, but don't make the Bible God. Let me give an example. Every good Baptist today, every good Baptist preacher is using the word inerrant, infallible. And they're trying to build this up, and it is God's word. It's been revealed, and the Holy Spirit guided its passing down to us, and it's our primary revelation of what happened at that time, but this is not God. God is God. God has given us enough in this, in this word that we can trust it. It's true. But don't oversell it as being God incarnate on this planet. Because the Bible is just a revelation of God. So just keep it in, in perspective there, okay? Uh, God will defend his word. Just do your best, but don't oversell it, okay? In discussing errors or problems, no, just get a good Bible dictionary. That's all that you really need to do. There are, if, you, if, you're, if one of your friends is one of those detail type of geek and says, oh, look at this, it's 7,000 people here and, you know, so many there. If you've got somebody like that that's a friend, just get a good Bible dictionary. I've, on the sheet of paper, I've listed a couple. Uh, if you don't want to buy them, I've got them. Just see me if you've got a friend like that and I'll help you n negotiate some of those, those issues. Um, don't confuse errors with imprecision. What I mean by that is, for example, I could say, yesterday we had 50 people at, at the um, Forgiving the Nightmare seminar. Okay. That was imprecise. We had 53 people. You see my point? So, colloquially, or common speak, we just round things up and that, you know, oh, hey, that was really great. There was around 50 people. Am I saying that there were exactly 50? No, there were, no. So, so the, many times the Bible does that sort of thing. Don't confuse falsity with perspective, and the Bible records things that it does not approve. Again, we have great confidence. Um, people who know a lot more than me and, and you, they look at this, they've studied it, and we can with great certainty uh, uh, and confidence know that this is God's word, it's his revelation to us, it's, it's valuable for, for sharing the good news. So, okay, let's continue on. Slaves and masters, and hold on to your hats. Here we go. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be paid, repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide for your slaves what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. So our view of slavery in America is, of rape, is based on race and kidnapping. Okay, it's horrible. But that's, uh, that's the lens by which we see slavery. In the Old Testament, slavery was also very harsh. But in the New Testament times when these documents were written, uh, are you ready for this? I'm glad you're sitting down. Up to half of the Roman Empire were slaves. Most teachers, doctors, and craftsmen had sold themselves into slavery for financial security. 
It was like signing an employment contract today. Does that change your perspective on how Paul is writing? Again, these are 2,000 years old. In fact, many of the first century, first Christians were slaves. Paul wrote, again, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. Slave and free had equal status in the church. In fact, are you ready for this? It is believed that two slaves were bishops in the early church. So can you imagine being, say, the master of this particular slave, and Monday through Friday he's working in your household, and then on Sunday this, this, this man is in charge of multiple congregations and their, their walk with the Lord. That's the perspective. So it's a, it's a very different, I mean, we, like I said, we've got some lenses here that we've got we've to adjust and, and kind of see it in their context. The pres our present world order is a lot different than God's world order. Here the slave, the worker, is to do the best he can because he's working for the Lord. But even though they may be doing a, a, a menial task, Jesus said, whatever you did for the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. Friends, work hard, not just because your boss's eye is on you. Give it your best because it pleases God. Now, like with husbands and fathers just a few minutes ago, pressure is on the master here. Don't mistake Paul's brevity for, for lack of power. When he says, he hammers them. You also have a master in heaven, so do what is right and fair. So let's go back to today's two principles. God has hardwired into his creation certain principles for flourishing. If we do these things, we will be blessed. And the second principle is where God is, there is order, there is beauty, and there is life. Let me give you a New Testament example. If I could have uh, the musicians come at this time. A, a good example is when Jesus walked on the water to the disciples. The disciples were out rowing their boat in the storm and they were not making any headway. And Matthew records they were being buffeted by the waves because the wind was against them. And they were already afraid because of the storm when Jesus comes walking on the water. Matthew says they were, notice he says they, he was there too. The others were afraid, but he says they were terrified and cried out in fear. Peter somehow gets the courage to step out of the boat into this wild chaotic storm, right? He gets his courage up and steps out of the boat, and like Jesus, he walks on the stormy waves. And then he notices the waves, looks at the waves, and Peter sinks, Jesus rescues, and then Jesus tells him to stop doubting. Then Matthew records these words, quote, And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Did you catch that? When Jesus came into the boat in the storm, there was peace and the storm stilled. When Jesus comes into your life, there is a peace that comes in your heart. The waves might still be there, but there is a peace in the storm. Where God is, there is order, beauty, and life. If you are frightened today, Jesus can walk into your room and say, peace be still. To the one who is trapped in sin, Jesus can set you free and say, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Put your faith in Jesus today and begin an orderly, beautiful, and abundant life. I think of one time Jesus loosed the chains of, loosed the chains of a man who had been bound and, and he was naked. And then it says later, and the people found that man sitting dressed and in his right mind. Where God is, there is order, there is beauty, and there, there is abundant life. To those who are weighed down, the Bible says, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. 
Maybe some aspect of your life is in chaos today. You know, what I find generally is that, so maybe our, work em our employment situation is good and our marriage is good, but then other relationships are bad. Or maybe, maybe our, our relationships are good at, at home and with our, our spouse, but our, 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 the storm is at work. Probably each one of us here has some area of our life that's more stormy than others. So what we're going to today, do today is I'm, I'm going to have the musicians play, and I encourage you to choose life. Choose prosperity, choose peace, choose order, choose God's presence in your life. And I'm going to do something crazy today. I, I love you guys in first service. I, I can be more myself. It's, it's, there's a, a lot less pressure uh, here with you guys. You guys love me. I mean, you're, you get up early at least, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And uh, I'm going to ask you to do something crazy. And this is going to make some of you uncomfortable, but we've already been uncomfortable. I want you to get in groups of four, five, and I want you to pray for one another. Um, because likely, each one of us has an area in our life that is stormy. And just like Peter got out of the boat and stepped into the stormy water, I want you to stand up and actually walk to somebody else and get in a little group and pray for one another while the musicians sing. Can we do that? Okay, to help you, let's all stand up. And why don't you start moving into groups of, of four, five, three, doesn't matter. Just get in groups and pray for one another. Heavenly Father, just guide us now as we, as we pray for one another. Truly, Lord, let your peace, let your order, let your presence come into our lives as only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen.